and uh, once we have the recording file, we will send it to everybody, post the webinars, all right? So um, let's see. So the first segment that I'm going to be doing is from resistance to organization and psychodynamic approach, which is really the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the webinar by itself. It's just this cover page. And let's see. Uh, let's look at the what is psychodynamics. All right. Just a quick read. It is an approach to psychology mostly ascribed to Freud, uh, also known as dynamic psychology that systematically studies psychological forces that underlie human behavior, feelings, and emotions, and addresses the dynamic relationship, okay, between conscious and unconscious out of awareness material, okay? So I know it's a, it's a mouthful, but um, this is what, loose, loosely speaking, what psychodynamics is about. As I was just telling, uh, Dr. Playman Dimitro, and he's well aware that psychodynamics is a very, very vast field of study. So it's not um, just this or that and the other. It's just a lot of loose <coughs> ideas, thoughts, feelings, emotions, all connected in a conglomerate, if you will. And what makes it really um, complex is its multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, status. Uh, so it's not uh, a one plus one is equal to two thing. Uh, there are a lot of variables in that. All right. So as you, as you immerse yourself in this learning, you'll find that uh, you will be almost in a sea, in an ocean of new ideas, new thoughts, new materials. It's also very likely to uh, trigger uh, some strong thoughts, feelings, emotions in you as you, as you go through the, the webinars. So please feel free to share. There's a very safe space for everyone. Um, feel free to share with us um, uh, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and how you might then apply it to your, to your own learning within the organization or the groups or coaches that you work with. So let me move to the next one. The three major questions that often come up are, how is psychodynamics approach to, to coaching different from the traditional coaching approach? And how does it address the unconscious psychological conflict in individual, group, and organizational behavior? If the unconscious is out of awareness, can it be understood and made sense of using psychodynamic tools all right so th this is a it is a dilemma because a lot of people that uh, that do the coaching or have done their coaching at icf or uh, affiliated icf organizations have learned coaching um, from shall we say a very cognitive psychological approach i do not believe and i and correct me if i'm wrong that there's a lot of um uh, emphasis at ICF on the depth psychology, on analytic psychology, on psychoanalytic study or psychodynamics even. So they may be taking concepts and um, introducing those concepts as part of your study, but uh, there's, they, there's no, not, not a whole, you know, depth sort of study or, or they do, don't, don't do depth segments when they uh, talk about psychodynamics coaching. Psychodynamics coaching is a different form of coaching, not that it doesn't take the tenets of traditional coaching. There's, you know, coaching is coaching, but uh, how, you, how you approach the clients, how do you tackle with their presenting problems, um, what kind of interventions do you make in your work with clients, uh, and the feedback mechanisms and how you hold and contain and, and work with clients, that's where psychodynamics comes in. And unless you're familiar with the terminology and the practice of psychodynamics, and more emphasis actually on the latter than the former, because you could learn the technology, learn the theoretical constructs, but if you really haven't been able to work with them, and employ them and, 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 and try to uh, apply them in the field, 
you're not going to really get uh, a feel for the psychedelics. So uh, how does the, the thing that always comes up is in my work with students, they say if the unconscious is out of awareness, all right, and out of your conscious awareness, out of your coaches or, or, or clients' conscious awareness, how does the coach or consultant then work with this? If you cannot touch something, feel something, how do you then bring it into awareness? So this is a dilemma. All right, uh, and there's no one size fits all. There's no one answer to that. Uh, it's, it's a very, very complex field by itself. But just please know that unconscious psychological conflicts in individuals, groups, and organizational behavior, you are going to start to become aware of because you'll say, hey, something is happening inside this group or something is happening in my dyadic encounter with this client that I cannot really put my finger on. I know there's something going on, but it's not conscious. It's not being stated by the client, but you are picking something up and you don't know what that something is. That something may or may not be totally unconscious. It also may be pre-conscious, which lies as a layer right below consciousness. So the unconscious you could consider as deep down in the iceberg, somewhere midway through the iceberg uh, would be the pre-conscious material and the tip of the iceberg is where, you know, the consciousness lies. And the conscious, as you know, the iceberg uh, analogy, what you see at the top is but one facet of what's really happening because there's a lot of dynamic stuff happening down below uh, in, in the iceberg. So um, let me move forward and then uh, just hold on to these thoughts. How does it address the unconscious material? If the unconscious is out of awareness, can it be understood and made sense of using psychodynamic tools? So this is just a, a definition of a traditional coaching. Executive coaching is a helping relationship between a client who has managerial authority and responsibility and a consultant who uses a wide variety of behavioral techniques and methods to help the client achieve a mutually identified set of goals to improve his or her professional performance and personal satisfaction and consequently to improve the effectiveness of the client's organization within a formally defined coaching agreement. I have found this to be one of the, the better uh, definitions of coaching because I think it encompasses so many different things. And if you look at the quotes and, uh, around the expressions, helping relationship, behavioral techniques and methods, uh, and then you look at uh, to improve the client's professional performance and per personal satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera, within a formally defined coaching agreement, I think you'll agree that it sort of covers most of what we do in coaching. All right. Okay, so in traditional coaching and consulting, um, here's the three typical approaches that people take. The systems approach and intervention. So the problem symptoms exhibited by an individual are a result of dysfunction in group or family of origin. The psychodynamic approach, individual has incorporated a lifetime of interpersonal relations and intrapsychic conflicts into mental, emotional, and behavioral patterns, some of which may be maladaptive. And the humanistic existential approach helps a person clarify values by viewing her with unconditional positive regard. All right, and the third one, uh, I'm sure you all have heard of appreciative inquiry. Appreciative inquiry is an outgrowth of the humanistic existential approach. All right, so systems approach and the humanistic approach are typically what are deployed, mostly deployed by traditional coaches and consultants who work outside of the field of psychodynamics. Um, they, they may use psychological tools and methods and assessments uh, and whatnot, but they, their interventions, their strategies are not steep in psychodynamics. All right. So, as we go through this course, uh, we will uh, 
we'll likely talk about the systems approach and intervention a little bit, also the humanistic side. All three, by the way, are critical. So if you start to work psychodynamically with your clients, you don't give up the systems approach and intervention. You certainly don't give up the humanistic side. You incorporate everything together. You hold it all together. And at the appropriate time and place, you use different interventions. So these are just shown as a variety of approaches that people take. All right, so I wanted to focus a little bit on the, on, uh, let me just go, I'm sorry. Just go to the next one. Psychodynamics of group executive coaching. I just want to share that group executive coaching is a new modality that some of you may not be familiar with. And while I, the reason I bring this up here at this point is to, to help you understand that a lot of the work that you do with clients in a one-on-one -on -one setting um, and given the, uh, given the, uh, the, the, the current, uh, I, I guess the current limitations on budgets and the time and whatnot, uh, come, more and more companies are now turning to group coaches. So a group coach is someone that can work effectively with a team of executives uh, and um, offer them the tools and competencies and the interventions in a small group setting, all right, um, and which, which essentially saves the company money. Um, and yet, there are other complexities to it, but just please know that group executive coaching is a modality which is catching on a lot. And, and we have created a proprietary course on group executive coaching, and we can certainly, you know, offer you more information on that. But I just wanted to share this with you uh, as that. So when the individual meets the group, certain things start to happen. Right, let's look at that. All right. And, I, and I, I'll just stay on this slide, and then we'll open it up to a bit of conversation here. So the group shadow, uh, this, is a, this is a quote by Jung. Okay, the group shadow is exposed to collective infections to a much greater extent than is the conscious personality. When a man is alone, man, men generically, uh, it could be man or woman, for instance, he feels relatively all right, but when in a group, he can give way to impulses that do not really belong to him at all. And I know, uh, I realize that many of you uh, from the ISABs, uh, some of done work in the Tavistock tradition, some have just done work with AKRI, the Rice Institute. Um, you're all familiar with what happens to people when they find themselves um, in a group setting. So when they're moving out from a dyadic encounter to a group encounter, there are other group level forces that come into play. All right, so just here, I, I'm going to, before I get into this next slide, I just wanted to open this floor out um, to, to anybody that would like to add something to what we have just talked about. So please raise your hand and I'll give the mic over to you. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, let's go to the, to to Plemen first. Okay. I just need to add to the transference and counter transference dynamics uh, into yes. the picture. Yes. Just to mention it because it's something of crucial importance in coaching and yes. work of the consultant. Absolutely wonderful. I, wonderful thought and thanks for that uh, that uh, that that nudge. I appreciate that. And I will be talking about a wonderful, very involved paper that was written by Manfred Ketz de Vries, um, who, as, as some of you might know, is the global leadership director, or used to be the global leadership director of INSEAD um, in France, Singapore, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, he is also now a very distinguished professor of leadership, and, um, and that he doesn't work with clinical leadership. I'm going to be talking about this paper. Are you mad, bad, sad, or glad? It is an, ex it's an exciting piece that he has written. 
and we'll be discussing this tomorrow um, it, it, when we talk. So thank you for bringing uh, in that because transference and counter transference may be something that some of the group are not really familiar with. So we'll uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Is that okay, Playman? Sure, sure. All right, great. Okay, who else had the hand up? Amit, you have your hand up. Okay, go ahead, Amit. Hey, Anil, hi. So I have a small question. When you talked about the group coaching, yes. when you talked about the group dynamic and you put on the slide around the basic assumptions. Yes. How do you define the primary task for the group? Ah, very interesting. Okay. And who, and, and who defines that? Aha, a very interesting, beautiful question. So let me mute you for a second and also go to others because I want some other reflections and thoughts here <laughs> before I address your, your, your question. So the question, did everybody hear that uh, from Amit? So who defines the primary task? What is the primary task? Okay. Well, how is the work group different from the basic assumptions group? Anybody else wants to take a stab at that? Come on, don't be shy. Raise your hand. Hey, it's okay if you don't know, but at least you can ask a question. And if somebody has turned on the video, I just ask that you please turn your video off. Thank you. Anybody? Yeah, uh, this is Mukesh. Okay, Mukesh. Yeah, go ahead, Mukesh. Uh, yeah, uh, usually the team is assembled by one team leader for a specific purpose. Uh -huh. so I am assuming that that team leader will uh, define what exactly is the goal for that particular team. Okay. And perhaps work with his team to uh, you know define it uh, to an extent where all team members uh, agree with that definition. Okay. Okay, all right. So that would be one view. Right, all right. Anybody else? Okay, Bill? Certainly, the most common thing we run into is just, as you said, around coming out of the hierarchy is what determines the primary task. I also want to point out that <clears throat> particularly given my understanding of psychodynamic approach, the other side, when there are teams that are more self-organizing, where the purposes emerge out of the group, often more implicitly, mm -hmm. is at least as fascinating to me right. as the things that come from top down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Great. Okay, so anybody else mm. wants to give it, give it a shot? And Neil? Yeah. Hi, it's Paula. I, I can't see where I can put up my hand. <laughs> okay, all right. But at least you can, so I, when you're telling fine. us you can't see where you can put up your hand, so we know you want to talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, just uh, coming from like an Adlerian perspective, um, yes. the task, work task, is a very sort of uh, individual. So I'm just sort of thinking it in that term. Uh, where, uh, you know, you've got your different life tasks and everybody sort of comes into their own uh, individualistic approach and very much so. I'm just thinking in terms of a group, it can obviously get very uh, complex when you've got so many individuals, even within a work context, right. where they all have their own very sort of unique concept of what their work task is. Uh-huh. Just, uh, that's just my perspective at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, I believe Alan raised his hand. Alan, go ahead. I'm unmuting you. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I've found is that uh, nobody really goes to a meeting unless they have to. Um, <laughs> there's so many, I mean, unless it's a voluntary, uh, excellent webinar that they can attend and learn something. Um, so, whether it's group executive coaching or um, the you know we're looking at the dynamics of uh, any other kind of uh, task oriented meeting, mm -hmm. um, it's part of our social contract. We're obligated typically to go to meetings, and so um, because of that relationship, 
it, it does have a tendency or at least the possibility of coloring um, the dynamics, uh, the feelings that we bring into it. Uh -huh. Oh gosh, uh, I wish I could be working on my project or I don't want to have to sit next to so-and-so. Right. <laughs> All the yeah. things we bring into that. Um, the leader, the um, um, official leader, or, right. uh, you know, has to take into, into account. Mm -hmm. And um, the individuals who, um, who um, emerge as um, leaders or instigators um, are those that um, often have a greater sensitivity to this. Hmm. Interesting. Very nice. Uh, appreciate your feedback. Let's see. Um, Kanchana, go ahead. You had your hand up. Kanchana? Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. I can. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so sharing my little experience. Okay. I've seen uh, teams and groups uh, succeed and fail. And conditions, you know, the when the task is given beautifully well defined etc mm -hmm. and i've also seen teams who keep asking for greater clarity greater greater clarity individuals when they take up jo jobs in uh, you know organizations right. and invariably keep asking for a job description okay so, and you know many of these people end up actually struggling a little more right. on the because a job description can only you know accommodate so many words right but when you go beyond that and you start interacting with your next team member that there, there's you know somewhere there are some, some fears or some of those kind of you know behaviors which have nothing to do with the job description or the task at hand actually right so to me the task actually becomes a little less significant uh -huh. the behavior takes over the task you know mm. Mm. if they were to do this all by themselves they would do it beautifully well but yes. give it to them and do it ask them to do it in a team few you know, especially the adults, it may not happen as successfully as it might even happen with children because they may not have so many of these fears that we see. Probably, I don't know about the children and adult part, but just my assumption. Thank you for your feedback. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else before we, uh, oh, Zafar Dean wanted to say something where I can't hear, we won't be able to hear you, Zafar Dean. Uh, let's see. Okay. Because um, your mic is not on. I apologize. Uh, maybe you're having some trouble at your, your end, but is there anybody else who wants to say something before I add my two cents into this? Please raise your hand. Nandani, can you hear us? Dr. Nandani Shekhar, can you hear us? Okay, I guess not. Uh, let's see, who else wants to uh, give it a go? So we're talking here about the primary task. Um, and, uh, okay, so let, I, I guess uh, Dr. Winston Jacob would want to stay. Go ahead, Winston. Uh, thank you, Anil. Yeah. Uh, I think one important factor is uh, we should have our grammar correctly in this uh, dynamics, I notice, uh, you use the word group executive coaching. Yeah. Uh, I think it should be turned to team executive coaching. Absolutely. A group is used very loosely. You're yes. very right. Very light. Very right. So I think it's very important that we use the word team instead. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, but having said that, uh, Winston, there's also a different bi difference between uh, the, the way group executive coaching is, is meant here because team coaching could be, you know, you're working with a team, loosely working with a team with no contract or whatever, but you're building a team. But with group executive, when we use the word expression group executive coaching, you're really talking about a very unique modality uh, where there's a lot of other pieces <coughs> that come into play. Uh, it's not like we could also be saying group facilitation. Group facilitation is not the same as group executive coaching or team coaching. So well, that's a separate discussion. But Winston, thanks for bringing that up, though. OK? Thank you. Thank and that you. is definitely worth exploring. Yeah. Definitely. I like that. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? All right, I guess not. So let me, let me, OK, Kanchana, 
Can I just lower your hand if you said it? All right. All right, so let's talk about what is this thing called the primary task? All right, so let me, let me paint a picture for you, a scenario. So I have a team, all right, that, uh, why, why go further? Why talk about that team? Let's talk about our own webinar, okay? So if you noticed, I emailed everybody uh, and sort of like in a loose way spelled out the primary task. The, one of the tasks is that you, you know, you were agreeing to attend this webinar um, for the 15th and 16th, uh, provided you some links. Uh, I also attached two papers for you to read and sort of get a sense for where we were going with that. Um, so that, it is a sort of like I'm stating what is the task for us. The task for us as a group is to come together. We've got people from Bulgaria. We've got people from India. We've got people from the U.S., Canada, Argentina. <coughs> and we're going to be getting together and learning together and sharing together. So that is the stated primary task. All right. In a loose way. This is not a very structured primary task, uh, as you would pro probably see if you work for an organization uh, and, and you're the team lead, there is a task that you set out for the group, which is a more specific task. Here's what your responsibility is. Amit, here's what Bill, your responsibility is. Here's what you would be doing. Here's what I would be doing. So that's kind of like a very explicitly stated primary task. Now, typically what happens in groups, and if we were sitting face to face, there would be a different dynamic occurring, um, and some of which also occurs uh, digitally and, and on the internet, but I don't want to read too much into that um, because it's, it would not be fair. I would not have all the data for me in front of me, which I would have if I have the paralinguistic cues and spatial indicators, if I was, we were all sitting face to face together and having this workshop, uh, I could see potentially your body language. Uh, I, I could listen to your tone. I could see, you know, listen for the words, certain expressions that you're using, uh, whether you're uh, intently looking um, or you're fidgeting or, 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 you know, leaning back or leaning forward. So I would be able to see all of that. Okay, and to a point, the facilitator mirrors what's happening in to the participants. Uh, so, if I were running this group um, in a face-to-face -face setting I, and set out a primary task, uh, it is very, very common. It's actually human nature, endemic to the human condition, that when a task is set out, the anxieties go right up. Believe you me, I have been doing this work for a number of years, and I'm sure some of you will agree with me on that, that the moment a facilitator spells out a task, the participants feel some anxiety. And how you work with that anxiety is, is, is the craft, is really the technique. Uh, because you could just totally... Um, dismiss that anxiety as inconsequential, you could say, no, nah, I don't think it's happening. All right. Or you could look at it more carefully and see, what, why is it that in a group of, we, we, we started out as a group of 37 members, and why is it that only 22 participants of the 37 today joined? Okay, I'm just taking an example. Now, we might say there could be a number of factors. Some people could not get on board, uh, technology issues, and all that aside, if you keep all that aside, what was happening to the rest of the team? Or, or not a team, really, the rest of the group. What stopped them from engaging today? All right. And that is something that we'll never know unless we hear from them um, uh, and, and they tell us what was going on with them, why they couldn't join, despite the fact that 
they had they they had set out the time the technology seemed to be okay um and they were ready why then they stopped from doing the job so now if you were working with a team yourselves and you had stated explicitly the task for the team some folks are internalizing the task and they know what it is that they need to be done they will go out of their way to please the leader they will do all of the work and and yet you see something you feel that there is something happening in the group which is sort of beyond awareness okay you you can only feel it but it's undermining the primary task, the stated primary task, the explicit task that you set out for the group. And a variety of these things could be happening. You might suddenly see that a, either a pop of faction of the group, two or three people in the group will talk incessantly, or some people in the group will be totally silent. Okay? You can also start to notice that there's a pairing that starts to occur. It's called the basic assumptions pairing. So two people could form a coalition in the group and form a pair and lobby on behalf of the group as though they were authorized by the group to take the group forward or to bring the pull the book group back. Keep that one thing in mind. We could also be working with basic assumptions dependency. I'm sure all of you, you've um, heard of dependency groups when a leader or when a facilitator takes too much, puts too much effort, takes on too much charge, becomes too autocratic, directive, intrusive, then the members sit back and say, hey, listen, why the heck should I do the work? He or she is, has taken the bull by the horns and the work is going fine. I'm just going to sit back and relax. So when a faction of the group or the majority of the group members sit back into their own silence and dependent mode, it can turn into a dependency group. And dependency groups can be very, very destructive. But how you turn a dependency group into an independency group is the key. And that's where psychodynamic tools can be applied. And we'll be, as we progress through the webinar, we'll be talking between today and tomorrow of how you can bring those people out, okay? Um, there's a basic fight flight. So I'm sure all of you have probably heard of these uh, expressions and they're not new to, to you if you've been doing any sort of group work. The fight flight is some members of a group will inevitably fight with the leader, okay? They want to sort of uh, derail what's going on. They want to change the topic. They want um, to sit back uh, and do their own thing, not listen, interrupt, intrude in what's happening. When somebody's talking, they'll interrupt the person. They want to take charge. They want to hijack the conversations that are happening in the group. They want to hijack, believe it or not, folks that are taking charge and moving towards the primary task people that are doing the work become their enemies sort of and this is by the way a very unconscious thing it's not that they they have any animosity towards the people who are doing the work but work to them is something that has come and now it's it feels burden burden sent to them burden sun to them and they want to understand what it is that they can do because they have a different concept of the work in mind. So as a leader, you may have spelt out the work to them. This is the project, but they have a shared fantasy in their mind of what that work means to them. All right. And so they will take that in and they will work with that and they will fight you to it. And they, you know, give me more information about this. You did not give us enough time. Uh, I, 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 I feel some anger, I'm frustrated, I don't understand. So some of the things that I think Kanchana had been talking about uh, or someone was talking about. Um, so these are, these are some unconscious forces 
in the group and, 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 not, and believe me, none of them is really consciously doing this to take the group off task, but it's just happening in a very unconscious way. There is also another basic assumption called oneness. So the feeling of becoming one with something that is bigger than them is also a basic assumption. Okay. All right. So they want to be one with something. Okay. They want to internalize the group. They want to be, become an integral member of the group. They want to move things forward. Um, they want to internalize emotionally the other members of the group. All right. They want to form that coalition with other people. So the feeling of oneness is very natural. But there's also, on the other hand, the pendulum also swings to the other side and it's the feeling of meanness. So they want to be, you know, why should I be sucked into this group force? Why can't I just be me? All right, why am I being called upon to become a member of this thing? I want to be independent of that. I want, you know, especially in very individualistic societies, such as the US, Canada, uh, some of the other countries, even though it's catching on in India also. People want to have their own individuality. So if I, why can't I just be a member of this group and just be me? Why do I have to get sucked into this group thing? All right. There's another basic assumption called annihilation, which actually has to do with the fight flight. I just think of it different. They, the idea is to kill off the leader somehow. Okay. Because the leader is seen to be a persecutory object. The leaders seem to be someone that's making them do the stuff. It's kind of like a parent-child dynamic. When the parent is asking the child to do too many things and the child is a rebellious child, but then, you know, the, the child wishes that the parent would just go away because then they don't have to do anything. There's also a basic assumption, togetherness, separateness, which also flows from oneness, meanness. So these are just some terminologies that are very useful in group dynamics. Many of you shared your uh, answers to the three questions that I posed. And uh, the majority of the answers that I got, especially around, uh, you know, what do you hope to take away from this uh, experience is uh, around group dynamics. You wanted to understand why is it that certain people behave and say some things or do some things um, that are counterproductive to your task, counterproductive to your objectives. And how does psychodynamics play into that? So the, the expressions that I'm sharing with you are very, very psychodynamic. And uh, I, I'm sure there's some folks here, especially at one that I can think of, Dr. Dimitrov, uh, who I think can share some more light on this. Uh, and and um, so what I'm going to do is, if it's okay with Dr. Dimitrov, I can just Unmute him for a second and ask him to share something about this. Go ahead, uh, Clavin. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you're right. Uh, it's uh, actually very important to, to say that uh, Wilfred Bion defined the first three basic assumptions yes. that groups in Tavistock and later in group relations conferences, uh, which is the typical method to explore this uh, group dynamics and the way group relations are structuring uh, the group life. And it's, it, it's important to say that in organizations, we all the time have group relations conferences. Yes. And you're right. Uh, it's very important to, to, to clarify that on the surface, most of the groups we are working in and with are with uh, some task defined or stated. But below, if you have the eyes and ears of a psychodynamically informed consultant or coach, you always find some relation to this different basic assumption mode of functioning. And it's very complex because it depends uh, on the history of the group of uh, personalities uh, who are members there, uh, their own issues they bring into to the life of the group. And that's why it's so important to be clear with the language, terminology, and to help people to develop their diagnostic filters 
to make sure that below the surface they really notice, they really uh, care about the possible basic assumption functioning of the whole group. And it's very important also to say that there are subgroups with different basic assumptions. Yes, that's right. I, I will give you an example to be more illustrative. Uh, st let's say we start a new training group. Right. People don't know each other, but they have some primary task defined based on their interest to the topic. Uh, in the first 30 minutes, when they introduce, they realize that half of them are executives. Others are just hoping to be executives in some time. And immediately the group splits and two assumptions are coming. Right. Uh, is the trainer or lecturer or presenter serving the executives? not me, <laughs> or, or is it the course to prepare people to become better executives? Right. Why me? I'm, I'm a good one. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Yes. So uh, this is just to illustrate and not to, to, to uh, add to more, much more water. Clarity of language is important. Right. And we, we really, really have to be thankful to Tavis Talk School that they define it pretty clear and yes. they still are working on making it uh, even more elaborated. Yes, de definitely. And thank you for keeping me honest. Uh, Playman, yes, the basic assumptions pairing BAP. BAD mm -hmm. and BAF slash F are bionic right. terms by Wilfred Beyond, who is a psychoanalyst out of UK. Uh, and of course, if you do Wilfred Beyond, you can uh, certainly uh, read up a lot of his literature. And, and I, I, I blame it in your ebook, you provided a chapter on this, right? Oh, uh, yeah, actually, I'm following. Uh, uh, it's an old book, by the way, it's 10 years old. So That's, even okay. Even That's okay. That's okay. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, we start training people who are uh, interested in psychodynamic approach to counseling, right? Uh, to consulting, organizational consulting, OD consulting, or coaching, right? Start from basic assumption exploration, and it starts like sensitivity groups. The yes, the classical yes. type because there's no way to 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 teach basic assumption. Uh, theory and the whole theory of group dynamics uh, without uh, being involved in, in intensive uh, uh, human interaction. So it takes at least five to ten days in such groups yes. of people who are not uh, uh, trained psychologists or psychotherapists to realize that the group is functioning uh, on on many levels, uh, many levels with uh, a stated task, defined task, or declared task, and many other basic assumptions which are not conscious. Yes, and thank you for bringing that uh, Tavis talk uh, uh, into that. You definitely, I totally agree that these are you know you do you learn phenomenal psychodynamics and 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 these strategies by actually engaging in them experientially. Okay, mm -hmm. because I could be, Levin and I could be talking about this till the cows come home, but uh, you'll really be able to understand this when you actually are, are feeling the heat within a group and when you're walking that, that talk. Uh, and uh, for those of you that are familiar with group relations conferences, uh, you already know that uh, it's a very emerging, right now, very emergent field in India. I'm certainly, playman has been doing a lot of work in uh, Bulgaria and other countries too. Uh, but that's the Tavistock type. And Tavistock is really about group level phenomena. Whereas sensitivity training, what was known as T groups at one time, were more about individually focused interventions. Right, Playman? Right? So yes, uh, Tavis talk is more more uh, uh, oriented to group level phenomena, understanding what's happening in a group. So the Tavis talk consultant will not single a person out in the group. He might he or she might say, "This is what might be happening in our group." Okay, and then everybody reflects on that. Whereas a T group trainer uh, and ISABs is an example of the sensitivity. Uh, the NTL side of the house, 
national training laboratories in the U.S. and outgrowth of that. So ISABs will focus on individual behavior of an individual within the group. And not that they, the group is out of the context, but it focuses more on that. So with that said, uh, and just looking at um, the time element, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you guys out to a, a methodology that I have hey, worked Anil. with. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, just to uh, uh, close that uh, discussion around the T group and the GRC, Tavistock yeah. approach. Yeah. How I view it is the Tavistock approach starts from the group. Right. Whereas the group sensitivity starts from the individual, as you said, but then it, uh, it moves from the individual to the intrapersonal and eventually yeah. to the group. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and hence the focus is not just on the individual. Yes. Just wanted to bring that distinction. No, no. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I did not mean to say that they don't talk about group at all. You are, after all, a part of a group. So group level forces are always going to be present, whether you're doing Tavistock training or other type of training. I'm just saying that the orientation as, yeah. the, as the forefathers or as the, as the founders of these movements, the focus was, one was focused on group level phenomena, the other was focused on individual phenomena. All right. Okay? All right. So let me just take you uh, now into a new journey here and we're just going to go just give me a second I'm going to line up the queue the slides here okay so as many of you that wrote back to me wanted to use this time to learn a new competency that they can readily use uh, in their coaching and consulting practice so as some of you already know, negative capability is very dear to my heart. Um, I actually did my uh, entire doctoral research, my, uh, my dissertation, my study uh, was on negative capability, which uh, is a expression that was coined by the English romantic poet John Keats. All right. Um, in 1817, he coined the expression negative capability. So it really comes from aesthetics and poetry, but it's been extrapolated into psychodynamic literature, into group therapy, into uh, psychoanalysis. So it's, it's a term that's really making its way very much into that. And you'll learn how. So the definition of negative capability is as follows. Okay. Uh, and this is a quote from John Keats. At once it struck me, what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously? I mean, negative capability. That is where a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. <laughs> so it's, it, before I go into the next slide, I wanted to ask, you all to read this again one more time. Hopefully everybody can see it on their screens. And what does it say to you? What are the thoughts that jump out to you when you read this? And I know some of you attended um, the workshops before with me, Alan, uh, and I think Bill also has done that. Okay, Ganges has raised her hand. Yeah, uh, Anil, yeah. Uh, the Keith slide is not visible. Yeah. What I'm able to see is the best practices in the group coaching. So uh, have you uh, moved to the other slide deck? Yes. Okay. So it's not visible on my screen. Never mind. I will listen. Yeah. Oh, is it visible on other screens, by the way? Uh, Jalpa here. Even okay. I'm not able to see it. Oh, really? That's, that's yeah. weird. Okay. So yeah. let, me, let, me do, let me do one thing. Let me just go back there and see, maybe because I, I, I did not log out of that, that one. Okay, let's see. Let's see what happens now. Okay. Yeah, but I'm, I'm able to see it. The screen has gone off, so you have to again share your screen. Okay. Uh, this is Mukesh, I can see it. You can see it? Yeah. Okay, just one second. Let me, okay. Now I think you just changed it. Okay, now just one second, okay? Can everybody yes, yes. see it now? Yes. 
Yes, Anil, it is visible. Thank you. Okay, okay. Because yes, what had yes, happened was I only minimized the other other uh, PowerPoint and it was still seeing that PowerPoint on the screen. Okay, so as we were saying, what thoughts come in? Oh, so Ganga, you wanted to say something or something else you wanted to add? No, that's all. Very happy to see John Keats. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, me too. Hey, I, he's a, he's a, um, you know, in my in my total in the, my memory banks. I've seen looked at his picture many times. Okay, so anybody else? I Kanchana wanted to say something. No, no, no. I'm fine now. So. Okay, so can you lower your hand? Okay. Does anybody wants to, you know, say something about this? I'm going to take you to the definition. So let me let me phrase it this way. How do you think negative capability as a capacity, as a competency, could be applied psychodynamically in uh, your work with uh, coaches or, consult uh, or or clients? Anyone? Okay, maybe this will help. Coined by the English poet John Keats in 1817. All right, so just read these uh, bullets, if you will, and see if it provides you a little more clarity. So what is this peculiar state in which a person is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching up to fact and reason? and a peculiar human capacity for containment to live with and tolerate ambiguity and paradox and remain content with half knowledge. To tolerate anxiety and fear, to stay in that uncertain mindset in order to allow for new thoughts and perceptions to come out. And to engage in a non-defensive way with change. So if you read these four bullets, do they speak to you in your work with clients? And if so, how? <sighs> Sri Vidya? Okay, just let me, uh, let me uh, unmute you. Go ahead, Sri Vidya. Yeah, um, so um, I, I found this article quite fascinating when I was reading it. Um, and I can talk about my individual work. Um, what I understand of negative capability is staying with that uncertainty, with that fear and with that anxiety um, and um, allowing, um, allowing something to emerge from that, uh, I wouldn't say vacuum, but from that space of not knowing, from that space of not having control. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, for me, in a sense, I, I, what I understand by this is um, it, it's being able to it's being able to overcome not uh, it's being able to overcome that sense of insecurity and not having control over um, over over knowledge or over the future and being able to um, you know being able to tide over that crisis. Um, mm -hmm. which sort of brings strength into the group in, in your case and maybe for me in the individual. I mean, I don't know if I can't oh, you, 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 did a, you did a wonderful job with it. I, I commend you for uh, giving a really nice, um, shall we say, a definition of that. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Thank, Thank you. Else? Thank you. Anybody else? Paula. Okay, let's see. Let's take go you all the way down here, Paula. Let yes. Me, let me find you. Let me find you. Okay. There's where are you? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead and talk, Paula? Um, I, yeah, I actually do deal with people mm -hmm. primarily on this level. And I find that, um, that the use of like metaphors or um, mm -hmm. encouraging people to step into somebody else's shoes because if they're, you know, and if they're sort of enmeshed in their own, 
anxieties and fears and that ambiguous state that it's sometimes easier to kind of shift into some other, some, you know, a different perspective so that they're able to, to look at that mystery from a, just from a slightly different, um, yeah, from a different edge and narrative, of course. Right. Yeah. Just sort of try to make some story out of how they're feeling to give them uh, a little more of an objective view. Right. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ganga, go ahead. Go ahead, Ganga. Go ahead, Ganga. Hey, can you hear me, Ganga? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Momentarily, there was a lot, lot of silence, which I didn't want to read into. But, <laughs> but, but. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, when I work with constellations, yes. um, one of the challenge for the coach is to allow the client to, um, you know, experience that difficulty and stay in that difficulty for a while. And, you know, uh, the desire of the coach to, you know, uh, enable the client to get a breakthrough or wanting to react can actually be a very big uh, detriment. Uh -huh. So I can, so this slide resonated a lot for me because it's really allowing the client to experience that stuckness right. and then you be a witness to that exploration. Right. Right. Very well said. Okay. Let's see what Bill uh, has to say. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, building, I think on Paula's comment, mm -hmm. it seems to me that one of the things that often helps is uh, consistent with your writing, uh, Anil, helping people see more than one story or yes. one narrative yes. to see their current circumstance without any one narrative capturing everything, but the combination of narratives capturing a great deal more and some of the unconscious things Right. than is possible by sticking to an original, uh, highly contained, defined narrative. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting. Interesting perspective. Thank you. Uh, Alan, go ahead. Can you Hi, hear Alan. me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Alan. Yeah, great. Um, following up with uh, Paula and, um, and uh, Bill, um, the giving up a control uh, is essential. It, what we need to do is feel, embrace the anxiety, really, like uh, Ram Das said, embrace, make love to the unknown. Uh -oh. um, if we don't embrace the anxiety, first we need to feel it um, and accept that it's there to, to, to develop self awareness. It's like, oh, what is this feeling? Uh, let it happen. And um, once you embrace it, uh, it's easier to relax into the information. And I would say, I would just add that um, uh, not just letting go of the uh, agenda, but letting go of the outcome. Mm -hmm. so we often go into these um, meetings and, and groups and, uh, you know, we have our intentions, we have our goals, we have outcomes in mind. And, um, we don't know what the outcomes, there are so many possible outcomes mm -hmm. that uh, we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't um, fully engage in the process of what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. And I think part of, uh, to me, and you know, I've been um, um, learning about negative capability almost as long as you have, because <laughs> I learned it from you, yes. what, nine years ago? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sure. Um, you know, although I've been a fan of Keats for, uh, you know, 40 yeah. years. No, I know, but um, you've been indoctrinated. You've immersed you in negative capability. <laughs> That's right. You're, you're dripping. Let's say you're dripping wet with negative capability now. And, and I don't want to dry off either. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, seriously, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a skill. It's something that we need to cultivate because 
um, as we know, our, our tendency, in, um, especially in Western society, yes. is that if we're not looking busy, we're not accomplishing anything. Yeah, that's right. And if we're not acting um, uh, like we're thinking, um, if we're not talking, then we're not participating, mm -hmm. uh, which is all wrong. You know, much of the work we do, um, who, who is it who said... Um, um, we learn to ice skate in the summer and swim in the winter. Wow. I, I, I think it might have, could have been Rollo May. I can't remember. It's too long ago, graduate school. But you know, the actual learning um, doesn't take place while we're focusing on it. It's, those are all the subconscious processes that add together and, uh, build up and make some sense. Our minds need some need that um, usage of negative cap capability to be open to that, so that what emerges are the patterns and the conclusions that our mind has such a capacity to discover. Mm -hmm. That's that's wonderful. That's excellent. Thank you, my friend. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. How about uh, anybody else before we move on to this? Next slide. I mean, I really want you to sort of, uh, uh, you know, at least try the process of internalizing this within yourself. Uh, Bala, you want to add something? Um, oh, yeah, I guess, she's, <laughs> I guess I was caught there. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to add that if, if you can um, encourage somebody to appreciate the fact that within their own subconscious within that realm and pre-conscious that mm -hmm. that that work is actually being done so sitting with that anxiety and that fear and and just sort of encouraging them to embrace it and understand that that's the sort of inter intrapsychic energy that will open up their creative um uh potentials um that's just another helpful way to to um, to allow them to embrace that and use the power mm -hmm. of, of that. That's all. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right. So um, great perspectives, excellent uh, thoughts. Uh, let me just move on to the next slide. Just so in, in the interest of time, we want to cover a few uh, important aspects. In this sense, negative capability is a sublime expression of supreme empathy. I really like this piece. Because um, I read it somewhere, I've, hopefully I have the attribution there uh, to the author, but if not, I apologize. And empathy is the capacity for participating in experiencing and understanding another's feelings or ideas. It's a creative tool to help us understand each other, understand different points of views or different cultures so that we might be able to express them. In, in Indian ancient scriptures, especially in the Jain, 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 Jainism doctrine, it's called Anakanad Nadaveda or something. I forget that. I'm butchering the name. Uh, but it just means multiple perspective, a pluralistic view. All right. So as Bill said, it's, ex it's really encouraging the client to look at the same things, the same difficulty, the issue, from many different perspectives rather than one that that client may be steeped in. So being able to see a things from another's point of view and to apply an open imaginative creative are both critical poetical methods to resolve conflicts creatively. So negative, let's look at negative and positive capability. So positive is how much we do know, how much we can get done and how quickly we can arrive at decisions. It begins with an already full plate overflowing with hidden agendas steeped in knowing and acting. There is no room for half knowledge or ignorance. Okay. So you might say, Hey, that's a damn good thing because that's the way organizations are. I'm always rewarded for what I know, what I can do, what I can get done. All right. How quickly I can get done. But negative in this concept, in this construct, negative has a different connotation. It's how much we don't know. It's starting with an empty space, resisting the urge to disperse into action when the anxiety and uncertainty are high. Okay? And being comfortable with not knowing and not doing. I love the expression that Alan used about making love to the unknown. Hey, Alan, could you? 
illuminate that a little bit because I'm having all sorts of uh, mental imagery. You know, how do you make love to the unknown? <laughs> Alan? Well, so you, well, do, you, drop, you drop a bomb and you thought you could just get away. Well, <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's, um, it's a discipline that um, it's an accepting. It's, it's letting, us, uh, letting ourselves kind of emerge or, or, or um, merge with what is out there. If we sit quietly and we, and we don't grasp mm -hmm. the things, the ideas, the concepts floating around, Right. around us if you just have this image of you're sitting you're sitting down your eyes are closed and there are all these images and thoughts swirling around you if you right. grab at them right. you're going to it's a conscious effort to try to make sense right but um I, you know my my thoughts are that um our minds are are um, you know simply amazing um machines right. and um not not that i wanted to use a mechanical model but i'm just using that as a, an explanation and that that what they can do is they um we, we can make sense of things um even before we know consciously that we've made sense of them right um like rapid cognition mm -hmm. um, it, it's uh it's a capability that we all have but um is mostly underdeveloped um, so I, I really, I really think that it's, it, it's particularly difficult, um, uh, for those of us that are highly rational, logical, yep. uh, anybody who's ha has a discipline to get a PhD, for example, <laughs> Shame on has me. to stay focused. I must be, I must be freaking nuts. <laughs> well, it, it, it just, it means that despite the, your, your uh, perhaps dominant, perhaps balanced ability to stay focused on, on your key, your key goals and issues, right. you also have the understanding or the capability to sit back and reflect yeah. and let it come to you. So yeah. it's kind of like accepting um, the fact that we don't know everything. In some cases, we know nothing. And, um, but we can be informed right. um, in an amazing way if we let the information come to us. All we need to do is immerse ourselves in it right. and, and let it happen. There would be plenty of time for active, um, active reflection. Yes. Uh, there's always time for that. That's what we're trained to do. What we need is to also train to not be actively reflecting, but to, to be in a state of receptivity. Wonderfully put. Okay. Thank you. You just wrote a small book, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can finally get a dissertation out I of think, it. I think you should. It's a shame <laughs> on you if you don't. All right, I'm going to mute you. And I'm going to go real quick down to the bottom of the list. Two folks have just joined. I want to acknowledge them and welcome them. Uh, Theodora. Okay. Can you hear us, Theodora? Theodora, can you hear me? Uh, hello, yeah, I can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay, great. Um, you're from Bulgaria, correct? Yes, I am. Wonderful, welcome aboard. Yeah, I'm sorry about the mix up about the time and whatnot. Uh, it was my, entirely my mistake when I sent the reminder. I put Bulgaria time as 7 p.m. It should have been 4 p.m. No problem. Okay. All right, I was collect. So hopefully tomorrow you'll join uh, at the right time and be able to catch in. But we are recording this session, so we'll send you that session too. Thank you so much. All right, and Janvi. Now I must say, John, I just get this message from Janvi who has just sent me a LinkedIn invite and I accepted it on my iPhone and the next thing I know is she wants to be part of the webinar. So it's wonderful to have you here, Janvi. And uh, do you want to just say hello? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this. Oh, you don't need my permission. Believe me. You know, yeah. it's a pleasure to have you on board. And you're also from Bangalore, correct? Yes, absolutely. I'm Welcome from Bangalore. Board. We have a strong contingent of people from Bangalore on this, yeah. in this group. Actually, we, I, we may have about 10 from Bangalore. Wow. So something's happening. Your beautiful garden city, Mayflowers yeah. and all that. Wow. Love the climate there. Love the whole ambience of Bangalore. But welcome and, aboard. And Thank Anil, you. most of us know each other. 
Oh, you do? Yes, oh. I do. Hi, Janavi Mukesh. Ah. Yeah, hi, Mukesh. Long time. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So now you know everybody and I'm the, uh, the outsider. I'm trying to get in. <laughs> so we meet you next time you are here. All right. Oh, sure. And certainly, I'm, I, I'm coming to uh, India on uh, December uh, for a third or fourth. And I'll be there for two months. So I'm definitely visiting Bangalore sometime in January. Okay, you're okay great. Yeah. All right, wonderful. All right, so let me just move on to, you probably have all seen this. If you've done any form of psychological work, what do you see? Some people see the goblet. Some people see two faces. Uh, and really speaking, if you think of it uh, from the standpoint of coaching and consulting, you're able to see the sketch, the figure, the diagram, only because of the empty spaces, empty white spaces around it. If I fill those white spaces with black, you would probably not be able to see the goblet. <sighs> okay, isn't that interesting? So, so the spaces are the negative space, the negative capability around a situation, around a presenting problem, around an issue, that we choose not to look at because we are concentrating totally on the issue and we don't know what's happening to the client. Okay, thoughts wise, emotions, feelings around that. So what is happening in that entire constellation? And I know Ganga does a lot of work with unconscious constellations and such. So maybe Ganga can talk a little bit about this. Ganga, you want to say something? Yeah, um, you know, it's really beautiful uh, the way this picture has been presented. And in Constellation, we call this as the knowing field. And it's really uh, has a very strong connect with the Gestalt uh, way of yeah. looking at it. Right. And uh, if I were to summarize, basically, when you are engaging with a client, you you are aware that the presenting problem is a figure that is very dynamic. So, um, you know, it's not that it's static and it's the same thing. So as a coach, you have to really flow with the energy and keep tuning into the knowing field. And um, I think a little while ago, there was a, a mention about, you know, uh, the universal energy and the unknown. So yes. constantly entirely works on your ability to surrender to the unknown and being comfortable holding the space and exploring. Excellent. Well said. Well said. All right. So let me just move quickly to the other slides. Integrating negative and positive space in consulting. You cannot exercise negative capability at the expense of positive capability and breakthroughs in understanding often occur at the edge of knowing and not knowing. So that liminal space, if you will, of knowing and not knowing, so you're at the boundary. If you think of it as a boundary, you're sitting on the fence of knowing and not knowing. And while one part of you wants to jump to either side, so you can alleviate your anxiety and rush towards certainty, there's another part of you as a consultant that wants to continue to be in that space and see what's happening in that dynamic. And that's what I talk about when I talk about negative capability, to be in that space and not that you become totally negative, um, uh, totally into the negative space or totally into the positive space, but to remain content with that half knowledge. Around every situation or presenting problem lies an empty space, like the goblet, the out of awareness issues, tacit, uh, 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 tacit issues, unspoken fantasies. The key is to resist the pressure to fill that space with our own assumptions. Perhaps one of the most difficult things we will ever do. All right. So, uh, so this is really the the the, the crux of that uh, that I'm that I've been talking about. Okay. And uh, let me, if you go to the we go to the next slide, you'll see that. And I just want to make a little shift into leadership, which is a lot of people we are involved in leadership. So positive leadership is about filling the space with what we know and get, get done. The goal seems to be to reach out for decisions, grab straws, just make it happen somehow. 
You know, that's what you're rewarded for. Have you ever been rewarded by your, your boss in an organization for saying, hey, you know what, Jalpa, I'm going to, re I'm really impressed. I, we want to actually commend you and applaud you for not doing anything. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we, you, you are such a reflective person and you think and you ruminate and you chew the cud and we are all going to recognize you for that, for not putting in all that, for staying in that half knowledge. It doesn't happen, right? Because negative leadership starts with the premise that like the submerged iceberg, there is much that we don't know about a situation. It starts with an empty slate, a transitional space, which makes room for feelings and emotions, one's own and others. So when you create that negative space, that emptiness in a relationship, you're allowing the other to bring in the thoughts and feelings and emotions. And you're also allowing yourself to contribute to that space and share your own thoughts and feelings. So it is through this mutual sharing of thoughts, feelings, and emotions that real work really begins to start to happen. So open space for reflective inaction. All right. I'm going to open this uh, right now for a quick reflection. So if you want to raise your hand, we, I'll be very happy to, to uh, unmute you. Go ahead, Paula. Uh, no. Your hand is raised. Shame on you for raising your hand. No, I didn't. I'm not, I don't even have my hand on the computer. <laughs> okay, what's going on? Negative capability. Okay, I'll lower your hand for you. <laughs> it must have just been my brain that did it. <laughs> Anybody else that wants to say something? <clears throat> So what is this thing, reflective in action? Uh, Anil, I would like to add Janvi here. Who's this? Janvi. Oh, Janvi. Go ahead, Janvi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I uh, what's coming into my uh, space is huh? uh, I'm talking about the unconscious uh, unknown. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What what comes as a coach? Uh, whenever we are, you know, in front of uh, our client, uh, if we can, if we can always, you know, I mean, come from that space of holding the space for them. Uh, if as a leadership coach, I am actually, you know, I go with the uh, intention that the person is whole and complete and then the potential is unlimited. Yes. And I'm open to that emptiness. Okay. I think I I, I will always uh, ask the questions and then hold that space in that unlimited, unknown, unconscious. And my client would definitely catch hold of that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that energy and, ref and I would be reflecting back and asking the questions and he would positively tap into his own unknown, unconscious okay. and bring that, bring that into Probably it would it may not come directly into the open, but maybe mm -hmm. it might go into one of those other quadrants. Could be mm -hmm. maybe he will, he will find something which he has hidden, and it's not done on purpose. Maybe sometime in his uh, uh, lifetime there could be something which was uh, hidden, and then he he feels that emptiness to share share it with me. Okay, with, uh, with the trust. And uh, that creates more space. I, mean, I, I just wanted to say that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Vishay. Yeah. That's a really good perspective about trust. Yeah. Definitely, yes. when you provide room, it's very natural when you provide the space for the others without invading that space with your own thoughts, feelings, without bringing your own agenda uh, into it. You, you allow, there's a vulnerability in that space. So people, when, when people like, people have a tendency to become more sensitive and vulnerable with you, when they know that you know the meaning, not only know the meaning of vulnerability, but actually can practice vulnerability yourself. In other words, yeah. to put it a different way, if you can be as vulnerable as them, mm. okay? Exactly. Yeah. So not come from a space of I know it all, not come from yes. this, where the mantle of the expert, okay? Mm -hmm. right. So for that period of time that you're working with a client, you sometimes have to take that mantle off and sometimes mm -hmm. have to show them that you too are comfortable with your own ignorance. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to quickly 
take a check with the group because we started off a little late because of some technology issues and all which some people were having. So is it okay if we go on for say about another 15 minutes? Sure. Uh, are, are you guys okay with that? Yes. Okay, great. And, and if you're not, if you're running um, behind schedule or whatever and you need to jump out, uh, please do so. Uh, believe me, uh, there's, a, there's a wealth of information that we have. And if you don't see it today because you have to jump out of the, the room, uh, you can certainly listen to the recording. So, so please go ahead and do what you have to do. But if you can stay for another 15, 20 minutes, that'll be great because otherwise we'll lose the rhythm and the step that we have, the momentum that we are creating here. Okay. All right. So uh, let me go. Uh, so, uh, so the slide here says, does negative capability lend itself to feelings of incompetence and ignorance within organizations? So when you say to, as an organization leader, that I want comfortable staying with not knowing, not doing, uh, and we'll see what emerges. Yes, you are allowed to do that for a period of time, but before long, you're going to have your boss jumping on you and saying, hey, Kanchana, what happened? You said you're going to be getting this thing back to me. Well, you say, hey, you know what, Ajit, I'm still reflecting, ruminating on it. Well, guess what? You're not going to be his or her most favorite person. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about. The organizational discourse about low status and high status. Low status is about waiting, patience, passivity, observing, imagination, detachment, disinterest, trust, humility, and empty. High status is action, doing, knowing, leading, directing, impatience, deadlines, assuming, and filling. I'm sure you can all relate to that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, this is just a quote from John Keats. Let us not therefore go hurrying about and collecting honey, be like buzzing here and there, impatiently from a knowledge of what is to be aimed at, but let us open our leaves like a flower and be passive and receptive, budding impatiently under the eye of Apollo, Apollo meaning the sun, and taking hints from every noble insect that favors us with a visit. My God, guys, if you could see me right now, I have, my body's broken out into goosebumps, All right? That's how profound uh, John Keats has been. His influence has been on my life, okay? And on my work and academia and, and, and the work that I do. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and this is just a quote that I wrote, uh, inspired by so, much of, so many philosophers. And all, Out of the mud of chaos, uncertainty and doubt grows the lotus, unstained as it were, by certitude, certitude meaning certainty, and the doctrinate of knowledge, the uh, idea to rush into uh, and fill and create theories and, and create hypotheses about what's going on, so is to stay in that empty space. Uh, negative capability, and this is a really nice quote that I have, through the exercise of negative capability, the leader becomes like the strings of a lyre, an instrument not for music or poetry, but for organizational inquiry, learning, and creativity. And guys, I know some of us are going to fall in love with all this stuff. Believe me, whatever work I do, whatever uh, things I create, I create for the good of the entire community. So you guys are going to get a copy, the entire PowerPoint slides, my deck. Please feel free to use them as you wish. If you say something that was written by me all i ask is you give me the attribution if you remember if you don't that's okay too but i would really ask that you use it judiciously and because this is all copyrighted material but i will share it with you with the group so you can use it and and take it take it forward and learn from it uh rejecting the shadow i uh, just want to jump a little bit into how negative capability uh, it comes into the Jungian parlance, which is the persona and the shadow. I'm sure some of you have read about the shadow and how the shadow manifests in everything that we do. So there's a, to think of what we, how we show up in the world, we wear a public mask. 
okay? We want the people to, to see what we want them to see. We want them to see all the good that we do, our altruistic parts, that we want them to, to really understand that we are really wonderful people, great workers, but there's a shadow side to all of us. And the shadow, look at the shadow as a bag that we carry around with us all the time, unbeknownst to us, in which we unconsciously project all the shame, all the embarrassment, all our inferiorities, all our insecurities, all our secrets, okay? So we unconsciously put into this bag all that stuff. So because we put it into a bag, it doesn't mean that it goes away. It remains there and it manifests, it sticks its ugly neck out every now and then. And that is why we, we have these things called the Freudian slips. Um, and we, we say, use, use metaphorical languages. And sometimes we are, and because the shadow is in our unconscious mind, it tries to manifest into the public sphere. So the more we push it down, the more it tries to push, stick its early neck out. And think of it as, it, as this, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. Try that anytime. Shine a light on a, an object, okay, and look at its shadow. The brighter you shine the light on something, the darker is the shadow, okay? Let's just think of that that way. Uh, holding the shadow is just a, you know, how to hold the shadow. With a nice picture there. Embracing the shadow is this. So there's a conscious side. There's an unconscious. Uh, at the core of this is the self. Uh, we have the ego, our persona. Persona is usually the public face. All right. So this is just a constellation. I'm sure some of you are already familiar with, with this. Uh, individuation and capacity building, emotions that emerge to fill the space. Again, there's a thing called collective consciousness, how we have developed together and things that we all know and do as part of a, a, a city, part of a country, part of the, the universe, that we all have the collective consciousness. Challenges in practice, negative capability, holding, containing, creating space for others, accepting ignorance of self and others, and living with uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts, difficulty with containing systemic pressures, deadlines, competition, one-upmanship, provocation, etc. Okay. In the current organizational context of radical uncertainty, the ability to lead demands precisely the capacity to tolerate ambiguity, uncertainty, and complexity in the present moment which is what we refer to as negative capability. So when you look at your clients, look at uh, the coaches that you work with, it's your capacity to tolerate the uncertainty, the ambiguity, and the complexity in that relationship, which gives you the craft, which really makes you better at the work that you do. It's by Robert French, by the way. Um, <clears throat> holding the center. I'm just looking at um, some of the things that, and this is a more involved, I've just put the slide there. It's a, it could be a whole seminar by itself. Melanie Klein's developmental position, the paranoid schizoid position, and the depressive position. And uh, maybe at this point, I can ask uh, uh, Playman to talk a little bit about it. Playman? Hi. Well, Melanie Klein is big issue but uh, uh, I, I don't know we, we are jumping from topic to topic but uh, what, what is important to, to mention here yes that uh, depressive position is not necessarily depressive it's about mm -hmm. this negative capability right. you mentioned. Yes. it's about this uh, patience authenticity of listening and experiencing exact signals of uh, uncertainty. And that's uh, a depressive position which sees uh, all the shades in the picture rather than black and white thinking uh, 
uh, of paranoid schizoid position. Yeah. Melanie Klein is uh, actually the analyst of Wilfred Beyond. Yes. Uh, what, what he knows and says about uh, basic assumption is very much affected by this capability of people to move from basic assumptions, group life, mm -hmm. to the depressive understanding that things are much more complex and we need to be patient at the same time, honest and sincere in appreciating the positive and negative uh, shades in the whole picture. And mm -hmm. that's something consultants bring to organizations, coaches bring to their clients. Mm -hmm. Capacity to stay in a depressive position, I would say in quotation marks, just yes. to make sure that they are uh, uh, living with complexity and finding uh, answers to their challenges which are much beyond the black and white or yes or no. Yes, yes, well said. Um, so uh, the reason I brought this here is because the depressive position has a relationship, as, as Playman was just mentioning, to negative capability. The depressive position is not as in depression per se, it is a position that was, or a stance that was created by Melanie's client in her thinking to make a contrast between the paranoid schizoid and the depressive, which is characterized by patients' contained responses, composure, thoughtfulness, wholeness, humility, and authenticity. Um, so thanks, Playman, for sharing your, uh, your, your thoughts on that. I appreciate it. Okay. Let's just go here. So uh, just moving forward with this, I uh, just wanted to share the times when a leader is expected to draw upon her negative capabilities are the times when she has to stand on the narrow edge of certainty. Okay, sorry, I just let slide slip through. When these are times when anxiety is the highest and the shadows that emerge are the longest and biggest, they tend to overpower and enslave the leader. Embracing the shadow requires a high emotional quotient and a deep understanding of self. Negative capability as a capacity to stay connected with the leader's ability to hold a shadow. All right. Good and bad breasts. All right. So in a paranoid schizoid stage of development, the ability to hold together the good and the bad breasts in one place is greatly diminished. There is an illusion that both cannot coexist. So we, as Playman was saying, we, we have to resist the tendency to jump into the black or white, okay? We have to be able to not only recognize the gray areas and also be able to hold the good and the bad feelings together. So in a, in a client relationship, you may uncover issues and concerns that are, uh, can be troublesome to you as a coach or consultant, but you have to have the ability to hold those uh, thoughts in your mind and also look at, the other side of the picture. And both have to be able to paradoxically coexist in your mind. So in a depressive stage of development, a painful realization occurs that with the good breast also lies the bad breast. For both to coexist, a state of ambivalence and ambiguity must be paradoxically worked through. All right? Okay. So... So this is again, sort of like a rerun of what I've been talking about. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about, about this, about holding the center. And at that point, in the interest of everyone's time, we will pause, we'll stop. And I'll open the floor to just uh, reflections and then we'll close the webinar today. So, the, so this is, I, I believe uh, Larry Gold uh, is now deceased. I think he, he died uh, several years ago. But he was a brilliant psychoanalyst, a wonderful psychodynamic consultant to organizations, and certainly has been my mentor for many years. And I really follow his work very eagerly. So the leadership capacity is equally diminished, both functionally and morally, in quite different ways, to be sure, if either types, paranoid, schizoid, or depressive, or pathology are in evidence. So whether it's the paranoid schizoid or the depressive side, it's, so it's not as though the depressive side is in you and you're going to be a star, okay? So if either 
is occurring, there is evidence there of pathology. But even if sufficiently worked through, neither of the adaptive aspects of each position are sufficient for exercising constructive and task facilitating leadership. Okay, so I'm going to stop with that and open the floor uh, to when I talk about the third position. Okay, and I'm just going to open this slide here and let you take a look at it. And this will give me a little bit of rest so that we can open the floor. So please raise your hand. And this is your time when you've been taking in a lot. We've been together for an hour and a half, a little bit more, hour and 45 minutes. Please raise your hand and share with us uh, your thoughts, reflections, experiences, whatever comes to your mind. Go ahead, please. Okay, Kanchana, raise your hand. I'm just going to, okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Kanchana. You can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I was just listening to a lot of these concepts, and in fact, I did try, I did try and read to the paper which you wrote. I say try because it's difficult to absorb all of this for yes. a typical, you know, I'm not a psychologist or I'm not trained in that area. Mm -hmm. A lot of other kind of, Kinds of work. The thought was really around this negative capability. I found that very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think we find enough examples of that in any democratic setup as well. Uh, you know, be it countries, community level, or you know, a family uh, level, or even in some team system. Right. I, I always feel I don't know, and correct me if this is right or wrong, whichever way. Mm -hmm. Moderation is the name of the game. Because if my capacity is very high to absorb and live with the negative in the other person, mm -hmm. see, I could actually be, uh, you know, seen as pursuing or uh, having multiple value systems, which could dissuade other team members. Uh -huh. So, so I think therefore moderation uh, yes. is probably very essential in every aspect. Okay. Is what I feel in my limited experience because I have seen one case in a, it's an organization setup. I don't know if there's time for me to share very briefly. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. So there's a small team, and the, the, the leader of this team is an extremely tolerant, adaptive person, can absorb, you know, can work with different styles of people and all the right things that's typically expected of a manager and leader, ideal leader, ideal manager. Mm -hmm. and, then he ends up having people in his team who look at work, the task that the point that we started off with, and look at their being in the team very differently. Okay. And it's highly achievement oriented and will go to at any extent to you know be aggressive upon the other person and you know to go on impressing uh, upon the leader on what is right, what this is the way to do and see the way I'm doing it is the best way, etc. Uh-huh. The other one. The other one could actually be saying that okay. I'm doing my work. This is what I can do. And okay. if there is anything more, you let me know. If there is feedback, you let me know. I'm open. I'm open to receiving more. Okay. Right? So, so what is the role that, let's say, the leader should play in this? So, you know, in terms of which is the negative cap cap capacity which one would talk about in this example. Right. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Uh, again, uh, Ganga, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ganga. Yeah. Um, you know, this slide on the third position yeah. reminded me of the third entity uh, which I use extensively in the relationship coaching. Mm -hmm. So uh, I leave it at that because, you know, uh, just doing a time check, there, there might be others also wanting to share. Oh, thank you. I appreciate your concern. Thank you. Um, uh, Nirmala, you raised your hand. Uh, just one second. Let me go to you. Where are you, Nirmala? Okay, go ahead, Nirmala. Effective point in terms of if I look at the negative capable capability of an individual and the negative capability of an organization as a whole, uh -huh. and, and and how do we relate as a self as an instrument? within ourselves and within the as an organization mm -hmm. so 
there might be a possibility of a mismatch or an alignment right so may how the individual or the organization react with the alignment or with the mismatch can be an exploring point and how together they can evolve further because as one of the slides you said the key uh, the boss will say okay it's time to do some action so right. then if you are in action and action and vis-a-vis -vis yourself as a self and the organization as an conscious collective consciousness right so that okay. is one reflective point good. i want to leave good. good anybody else before we close please share your thoughts Okay, I guess uh, there's nobody who wants to say anything. I know, I know it's late. And okay, be, uh, Playman raised his hand. Playman, go ahead. Uh, well, I need just to, to say thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Anil, and thanks uh, to all participants. It's uh, self-evident that uh, we we. Are touching just the surface of the topic and I am very hopeful for tomorrow if we stay in the same same team and involve even more people. Yes. Uh, I do believe that it's uh, very important to develop a glossary and to continue this conversation much more hours than we just planned for this event. Sorry. Yeah. People are coming for another meeting with me. I have a session. Oh, here. that's that's fine. And Plevin, thank you so, so much for uh, uh, for you tomorrow, all of you. Yeah, tomorrow I want to share uh, going to the models and tools for probing the hidden organization. Okay, and also work uh, on some glossary for defense mechanisms, which come up in our work a lot. So, so we'll talk a little bit more tomorrow. We'll be more into engaging and learning about the experiences of others. Okay, because I think that enriches the uh, conversation. So thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate the time. And even though we went a little over, I appreciate your generosity with uh, staying engaged. Uh, I, we will create uh, a recording of this and it will be shared with the entire group. So thanks again for uh, your support uh, and, 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 and interest in this. All right. Thank All right. You. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.